Well, good afternoon. Let's uh, let's begin here. Uh, so I uh, emailed back your um, midterm tests uh, yesterday evening. Hope you all got those things. Um, let me just uh, say uh, a couple of things about those. Um, so um, you know, the the average was uh, thirty three out of forty, um, and um, you know it was it was a perfectly respectable range of performance uh, on that, um, and you know I just want to emphasize I'm not going to be um, trying to murder anybody when it comes to the letter grades for the course, uh, and so. Um, you know, a, it's a respectable range of performance and there'll be some respectable range of letter grades in the end. Um, and there is certainly no reason for anybody to uh, panic about this sort of thing. Uh, if any of you are disappointed about the test and want to discuss privately with me, um, fine, just send me an email and we can make a time to have a private discussion about that. Um, I, I didn't post the solutions, I guess I should just as a way to help prepare for the final. Um, I'll, I'll do that within a few days. I, um, uh, I have a big physics conference that's going on online this week. And so I'm kind of distracted by that, but I'll, I'll, I'll do it within a few days. Um, I tried to make um, you know little comments on the test papers wherever I could just catch anybody's mistake. Um, I I guess I I don't have any general comments about the um, the problems. Well, let me say one thing in kind of in general about the problems. Okay, so this is this is for me to um, sound like a grouchy old man. All right, so I'm, I'm not really a grouchy old man, but I can play one on TV. Um, so um, there were um, a lot of situations, especially on the problem with the Fourier series, number two. Um, there are a lot of situations where um, students knew what methods to use, but just got the wrong answer in the end. Um, because of mistakes with integrals or derivatives or algebra or whatever, right? And um, this, you know, is kind of the difference between um, being a student of physics and having a job in physics, right? That when you're a student, you want to make sure to get the right methods. And then, you know, you'll get most of the points in partial credit and, you know, get a decent grade in the end. Um, when you have a job working for a boss, um, you know, the, the boss really wants you to get the right answer, right? I mean, I've, I've never met your boss, but I can tell you with great confidence, your boss really wants you to get the right answer. And, um, and so, you know, it's, it's inevitable that people will make algebra mistakes. And so, you know, you want to, um, seek out ways to catch these mistakes before you give your results to the boss, right? And so, um, you know, you, you, you need to have like strategies for catching things. And so not just to say, be more careful. I mean, everyone needs to be careful, right? But even however careful you are, you're bound to make mistakes, right? And so, um, let's let's think about you know what are some possible strategies for catching them. Uh, here, let me let me write this down so I can share the iPad. Um, share. Okay. So, uh, like ways to catch mistakes. I could say one is um, to um, be uh, aware of you know, what numbers should be real and what numbers should be positive. Um, so 
you know, in, in quantum mechanics, for example, the, um, the average of any observable thing should be real, right? That's, that's part of how we figured out um, properties of Fermi-Shin operators is by the assumption that um, physical things like position and momentum are, are real numbers, right? And um, likewise, the average of something squared, of a real number squared should be a positive number. Um, and so, you know, if you do a calculation and you find that something like that is, is not the kind of number that it should be, um, you know, maybe you've discovered some new law of physics or maybe you've made a mistake, right? And so you should certainly, um, you know, take that as a reason to go back and double check and think that maybe you made a mistake there, right? Um, a second thing would be to um, be aware of, of uh, dimensions, right? That is the, the units, right? What, what kinds of physical quantities are, um, lengths or times, things like that, right? And that provides uh, a way to check big calculations as you're going along, right? And so, for example, um, you know, if A is a length, as in the problems that I had on the test, right, then, um, if you have any equation that has something like a squared plus a, um, well, I mean, that's a mistake, right? Because this, this is uh, an area plus a length. And um, you know that you can only add things that have the same units, right? Or if you get something like um, the, the sine of A, right? That's also a mistake, right? Because you can't take the sine of a length, right? That the sine is a kind of function that needs a dimensionless input and produces a dimensionless output. Um, and so um, you know, these are, are things that you can notice just as you're going along. Right? And you, know, you, you could say, oh, well, I'm accustomed to seeing expressions that look like a uh, sine of Ka, right? where A is a length and K is a one over length. And so you know, this is what you're used to looking at. So this should look weird. Right? And um, that would be a tip off. And you know, really when, when I'm catching mistakes on student papers, um, this is the kind of thing that, that I notice. Right? And so um, if I see that a student you know, has a final answer that has the wrong dimensions, um, I look sort of you know, halfway down in the calculation and see you know, in a random line halfway down, um, um, do I see a, a weird looking thing like this, right? And so that's how I know, you know, is the mistake above or below that point, right? And, um, you know, I can kind of zoom in on the mistake that way. Um, and so, you know, it's the kind of thing that you're, that you can be aware of as you're going along, right? The same way that like when you're driving a car, you're aware of where the other cars are around you. And, um, you know, not mainly thinking about that, but you're kind of aware of that. Um, and another thing I'll put on the list here is to, um, you know, you can, you can um, learn to, to use um, computers for symbolic calculations. Um, that is, it could be software like Mathematica or um, online uh, integral calculators. 
um, you know, I'm not saying to be helpless and totally dependent on those things, right? If you need to integrate uh, X squared, right? You shouldn't have to boot up a computer for that. Um, but, um, you know, when there are big integrals, um, these things can provide a check on what you do. And they're not likely to make the same mistakes that humans do. They might make different mistakes, but they probably won't make the same mistakes. And so um, that could be a, a double check on the things, things that you do. Right. Um, and, um, you know, maybe a fourth thing is to um, uh, plot your results for uh, sample parameters. You know, the kind of thing that I do when I'm showing you these Mathematica demos, right? And just to, to put in parameters like, uh, you know, h bar is one some length a is one, that sort of stuff. And you know, see what the results look like. And so you know, if you have a Fourier series that's supposed to be an approximation to a certain function, you can see it doesn't look anything at all like the uh, function that it's supposed to be an approximation to. Right? So um, you know, that's an, another possible approach, right? And you know, when, I, I understand that when you're a student, you know, if I tell you four ways to catch mistakes, you think, oh no, four more things I have to do. Um, and it, it sounds like work. It is work. Um, but, um, but, you know, when you're out in a job and you, you want to uh, minimize the, the mistakes that you send up to your boss, um, you know, then, then you're happy to have extra ways to make checks like this. Um, okay, so that's my my Groucho Man story. So I'll 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 stop there, right? And um, let's um, let's just um, you know, think about those as we as we go on. All right, um, good. Let's go on to other stuff besides the test. Uh, so um, there's actually one more thing I want to tell you about matrices following up on yesterday's class. So something I didn't have time to talk about yet yesterday, uh, but I think maybe it's worth mentioning. Um, and that is that, um, you know, we've, we've talked about commutators uh, in this semester. All right, we've talked about commutators of operators. All right, and so if you have operators A and B, uh, then this means what do you get by putting them together in one order compared with what do you get if you put them together in the other order? Um, so, you know, for example, uh, you know, multiplying by x is one operator, and the derivative with respect to x is another operator, right? And so we figured out what is this commutator by seeing what does this do to a test function like f of x, right? And, um, and so you know, there's a general result for that. So all this commutator stuff with works with operators, and we have um, proven a couple of general results for that, right? We've proven the generalized uncertainty principle, and we've talked about how uh, expectation values vary with time. And those are both related to commutators. Um, so what I wanted to emphasize to you now is that this whole concept um, also works with matrices. That is, um, if you have any two matrices, you can put them into a commutator. And it's the difference between what you get by multiplying the matrices in one order versus multiplying them in the opposite order. Um, 
So you know you you remember from your linear algebra classes that um, matrix multiplication is not commutative, right? That when you multiply two matrices, uh, it matters which goes first and which goes second, and so um, the difference of those things is the commutator between the matrices. And all the stuff that we have proven for uh, commutators of operators, that's all still true for commutators of matrices. So just to show you an example, let's, let's go back to the same example I was working with yesterday, right? with the, the two-state system. Um, where we have you know, a particle that can be in two possible positions. And the Hamiltonian is this F, G, G, F, um, where uh, F and G are two real numbers. And the position operator X is this one, zero, zero, two. Um, okay, so that means we can find the commutator of H with X, right? So we can multiply them in both possible ways, okay? So um, HX is equal to FGGF times one, zero, zero, two, okay? So that's a two by two matrix, okay? And so in the upper left corner of this matrix, we have uh, F, you know, we multiply this way, right? So it's F times one plus G times zero. Uh, that is F, okay? Upper right, it's F times zero plus G times two, two G, okay? Lower left, it's G times one plus F times zero. That's G. Uh, lower right, uh, it's G times zero plus F times two. Okay. Um, how about putting them in the other sequence? Okay, so uh, XH. Okay, so that is one, zero, zero, two and F, G, G, F, like that, okay? So, um, uh, in the upper left, okay? F times one plus G times zero, F. Uh, upper right, G times one plus F times zero, it's G. Uh, lower left, okay? F times zero plus uh, G times two. And lower right, uh, zero times G plus two times F. Okay, so then we have a commutator of these two matrices. Okay, so uh, that means that HX minus XH, that is uh, F. 2G, G, 2F minus um, F, G, 2G, 2F. Okay, and when we're subtracting matrices, we just subtract the things at the corresponding positions. So that is um, zero G, negative G, Zero. Um, okay, so that's the commutator of two matrices. All right, and um, it's not zero, right? Not equal to zero. Um, so we would say um, H and X do not commute. Right, those are the, the words to say. Right, that the commutator is not equal to zero. Um, so then you could say, well, what do we do with that, right? Well, um, 
we can use um, any of the theorems that we had before. Uh, well, theorem is a fancy word. Any of the results we had before about uh, commutators, right? So for example, um, we, we showed uh, about the, the time derivative of an expectation value, right? Yeah, if we want the time derivative of an expectation value for any old operator Q, right? That this is um, I over H bar times the expectation value of the commutator of H and Q plus this, this other weird thing that I don't like to talk about, but it's in the book, so I feel like I have to mention it. Okay, so this, this thing that only applies in weird cases where Q explicitly depends on time, right? So this is for any operator Q, and this equation you know, has a special place for the Hamiltonian. Um, and it's a special place for the Hamiltonian because the Hamiltonian is really important in how things depend on time, right? The Hamiltonian is the operator that goes into Schrodinger's equation. So let's apply it to the position that we were talking about um, yesterday. Okay, so um, here, uh, well, yesterday, one big thing that I derived yesterday was the uh, average of the position in the state that solves Schrodinger's equation. Okay, and so, um, Yesterday, right, uh, we found that the average position is one plus the sine squared of GT over H bar. Okay, so um, if I just take the derivative of this thing, right, that means the time derivative of the average position is um, two sine gt over h bar uh, times uh, cosine gt over h bar times uh, g over h bar, right? That's the um, derivative of uh, sine squared. Um, so let's check it and see if, um, this equation right there works for calculating the derivative of an operator x. Okay, so let's let's do that. Okay, so the um, time derivative of the average x should be. Um, I think I calculated here. Uh, it should be i over h bar times the expectation value of the commutator of h with x, right? Plus the, the weird thing, but forget about that. Okay, because x does not explicitly depend on time. Okay, so that means it's equal to, oops, it's equal to i over h bar, the expectation value of the thing that we just calculated, a two by two matrix that goes in here, right? That is this, this operator, zero, g, negative g, zero. What that means is i over h bar, this inner product of the state psi with zero g, oops, negative g, zero, inner product with psi. Okay, so let's multiply it out. So in the middle, we have this operator, the commutator as a two by two matrix. 
Right. Over on the right, we have the, the ket that we figured out last time. Okay, so that ket is uh, e to the minus i f t over h bar uh, cosine g t over h bar negative i sine g t over h bar. Okay, and over on the left, we want the corresponding bra which is the complex conjugate um, as, as a row vector instead of a column vector. Okay, so e to the i f t over h bar, and then the row vector, which is the cosine, and then i times the sine g t over h bar. All right, so um, here, uh, this complex scalar cancels this complex scalar. And then what? Then we can multiply these things out. Okay, so that is uh, I over H bar. And let's see, uh, I'll just recopy the row vector and I'll multiply the matrix times the column vector. Okay, so for the matrix times the column vector, uh, let's see, it's zero times the cosine plus G times negative I sine. Okay, so negative I G sine G T over H bar. And then on the bottom, negative G cosine G T over h bar um, plus zero times the sign. Um, all right, so now let's um, multiply all this out. Okay, so it's i over h bar. And so the first term is um, negative i g sine gt over h bar cosine gt over h bar, okay? And then the second term, well, it's actually the same thing, right? Negative i g times sine times cosine, so times times two, all right? So this is, uh, let's see here, the i cancels the negative i, and so we get um, two G over H bar sine GT over H bar cosine GT over H bar. And, oh, look, good. And so it comes out the same, all right? And so, um, you know, all this stuff with commutators, you know, the moral of the story is all that stuff works with matrices also. And so um, when, when you have commutators you know, ex of things expressed as, as operators on functions, you, know, you have to go through the process of letting them act on test function, maybe using the product rule, anything like that. Um, but when you have your operators expressed as matrices, um, it's more of a mechanical process, right? You can just do the matrix multiplication one way and do the matrix multiplication the other way uh, and subtract. Um, fine, that's, that's it, right? And so you know, it provides a very concrete way to think about all these uh, calculations. All right. So I think that wraps up all the things that I wanted to say about chapter three, okay? And this has been kind of a long chapter and um, it's a, a chapter that is um, kind of mathematical, right? There's a lot of proofs in there, um, 
but it's it's setting up you know a couple of alternative ways of thinking about quantum mechanics of thinking about quantum mechanics with uh, vectors and uh, matrices you know as an alternative to thinking about quantum mechanics with uh, wave functions and derivatives acting on wave functions um, and you know these things are equivalent to each other and they kind of complement each other and you know that's um, it's something that I like in theoretical physics that you know you get alternative ways of thinking about the same things and um, that can kind of enrich your understanding of any subject. So um, that is my story about that. Okay, so at this point, I guess I'm ready to move on to a new chapter. Okay, so let's do that. Okay. Um, okay. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to entertain any closing questions about chapter three. Like, was it really worth it? But um, but if I don't hear that one, I'll just move on. Andrew, are you asking or you're just? Yeah, I have, a, I have one question just about that um, position matrice. So mm -hmm. it's like one, zero, zero, two. If that was a three by three matrice, would it be like one, two, and then three on the diagonal? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of making up a, 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 a simple little example where uh -huh. um, there's a position number one, which is x equals one, and a position number two, which is x equals two. Right? And so um, what you just said you know, is, a, is a correct generalization of the funny little example that I made up uh, is if there are three positions, right? So positions one, two, and three. So, so yes. Um, now, um, Normally, when people are working with small matrices like this, um, it's because of things related to angular momentum, which is what I'm going to be leading into over the next couple of weeks. Uh, and so there, there will be some more realistic examples of matrices like this related to angular momentum, which you'll see soon, but you haven't seen yet. That's why I made up this funny position example instead. Okay, so to, to move on to chapter four, okay, so um, this is about uh, quantum mechanics in three dimensions, right? And so you know, this is really the, the realistic case, right? I mean, the one dimensional problems that we did before, these are sort of, idealized problems that don't come up so much in real life, right? The real life is more three-dimensional. Um, and so um, here we're going to get started with thinking about um, how do we generalize from one dimension to three dimensions. Okay, so some of this generalization is well, I won't say simple, but straightforward, right? It's like natural things, you know, the, the same things we do for functions of X, we do for functions of X and Y and Z. Um, so there are straightforward extensions like that. And then there are some new features that come in when you're working in three dimensions that don't have one dimensional analogs. Okay. So let's, let's start with the kind of straightforward things. Okay. So um, to begin with, we have a wave function. And you know, when we were in one dimension, we just had a psi of x and t. But now we're in three dimensions. So the wave function can't just depend on x and t. It has to depend on x and y and z and t. You know, so it's a function of four variables. Um, often to save on writing, we say it's a function of the position vector and time, right? where here the 
the position vector is um, R is X, Y, and Z, right? So um, this function of R and T, it means exactly the same thing as a function of X, Y, Z, and T. Um, okay, and um, then, you know, we have some statistical interpretation of our wave function. So when we were working in one dimension, we knew that the wave function magnitude squared was the probability of finding, excuse me, the wave function magnitude squared times dx made the probability of finding the particle in a little interval of x, right? Between x and x plus dx, right? So it included some little tolerance in one dimension. Right? Here, we have to scale it up to three dimensions. So we could say that we take the magnitude of psi of x, y, z, and time, that magnitude squared times dx, dy, dz, right? And this is the probability um, that um, the particle is between x and x plus dx and between y and y plus dy and between z and z plus dz, All right? So, you know, you could visualize uh, a little box, some rectangular box in three dimensions, okay? And, you know, here in one corner of the box, this is the point x, y, z, right? And then um, the box has some size dx in the x direction and dy in the y direction and dz in the z direction, okay? And so um, this uh, quantity, the psi squared times dx, dy, dz, right? That's psi squared times the volume of the box. This is a volume dx dy dz. Okay. And so um, the psi squared times the volume is the probability that the particle is in this little box, as opposed to anywhere else in three dimensional space. Um, Okay, and as always, the probability has to be normalized, right? That is, if you add up the probability that the particle is here or here or here or anywhere, it has to add up to one, okay? So we have a normalization that the uh, one is the integral from minus infinity to infinity dx. And the integral from minus infinity to infinity dy. And the integral from minus infinity to infinity dz of psi of x, y, z, and t magnitude squared. Right? that this has to be true uh, 
for all time. Um, now, there are shorter ways to write this. Okay? So typically people don't write out all of these integrals explicitly just because it's just too much writing, too much work. Okay? And so usually to save time, people just write the integral dx dy dz of psi of x, y, z, z squared. All right? And um, this means this. Okay? It's just a shorter way of writing that. Okay? And so um, in particular, you should be aware that um, you know, here in this shorter way, we're not writing limits on the integral sign, okay? But there are limits, right? It is still a definite integral uh, for x from minus infinity, y from minus infinity, uh, z from minus infinity, okay? So we're doing the arrogant thing of saying, well, everyone knows we mean the definite integral. So because everyone knows that, we don't actually have to write that it's a definite integral, okay? So you should make sure you know that is still a definite integral. Even though it maybe looks like an indefinite integral, it is not an indefinite integral. It's a definite integral over everything from minus infinity to infinity. And sometimes to save writing even more, um, people write this as the integral d cubed r of psi of r and t squared. Okay. And um, th this, whoops, uh, th this means the same thing as that and that, right? These are just shorter ways of writing the same thing. Okay. Um, all right, so this is the notation for a wave function in three dimensions. And so eh, you can see it's about the same idea as in one dimension, but just scaling it up to the three dimensions. All right. Now, um, how about for the time evolution in Schrodinger's equation? Okay. So Schrodinger's equation also generalizes from one dimension to three dimensions. So for Schrodinger's equation, we have uh, I h bar times the time derivative of psi of x, y, z, and t. Okay, that's on the left side. And that's equal to the Hamiltonian acting on psi. Okay. So you know, here it's a partial derivative. You have a function of four variables, and there's a derivative with respect to the time variable. And so that equals uh, the Hamiltonian acting on psi, and the Hamiltonian now, that has to be um, the momentum vector squared over 2m plus the potential energy that's a function of x and y and z. Okay, so the Hamiltonian is now expressed in terms of the momentum vector, which means, as you know from, from classical physics, that means the x component of the momentum squared plus the y component of the momentum squared plus 
the z component of the momentum squared. So it's all that stuff plus v of x, y, and z. Okay. Now, you know from quantum mechanics in one dimension that the x component of the momentum corresponds to an operator. It's the operator negative ih bar d by dx. This same thing works for y and z in just the way that you might guess. Okay, so that means py is negative ih bar d by dy. And pz is negative ih bar d by dz. Okay, so um, in that case, um, the Hamiltonian operator, oops, the Hamiltonian operator is um, 1 over 2m. Okay, and now we have the px squared plus py squared plus bz squared. Okay, so that's negative i h bar squared um, d squared by dx squared plus d squared by dy squared plus d squared by dz squared. Okay, and then plus this potential energy as a function of x, y, and z. Now, this combination of derivatives is something that um, hopefully you, you recognize from math classes and other physics classes. Right? So this combination is called the Laplacian operator. Okay? So the Laplacian means uh, that you take the second derivative with respect to x plus the second derivative with respect to y, plus the second derivative with respect to z, and add up all three of those second derivatives. Uh, so this sort of thing shows up a lot in um, e and m. Right? And um, so here we have the same thing in quantum mechanics also. Okay? And um, this is something which uh, American physicists often write as this del squared operator. So um, this uh, symbol right here um, means that. Um, occasionally, there are some books that write it as just a delta like that. Um, not so common among American physicists or the textbooks that we use, but you will see that especially from other countries. Um, so just to be aware, that's a notation that you might come across someplace. Um, okay, so then Schrodinger's equation. Okay. So for the Schrodinger equation, we have um, I h bar d by dt of psi of x, y, z, and t. Okay. That is negative h bar squared over 2m. Right? So the negative comes from the negative i squared. And here's the h bar squared over 2m. Okay, so h bar squared over 2m, uh, Laplacian of psi plus v of x, y, z times psi of x, y, z, and time. Or if we really wanted to be um, verbose, we could write this out as h bar squared over 2m, uh, you have the second derivative of psi 
with respect to x, plus the second derivative of psi with respect to y, plus the second derivative of psi with respect to z, plus v of x, y, z times psi of x, y, z, n time. Um, okay, so this is Schrodinger's equation now, scaled up from uh, one dimension to three dimensions. So, um, you know, our goal is going to be to solve this for sample three dimensional problems, okay? So uh, this equation is a second order partial differential equation, right? So we want to solve it for a function of four variables, x, y, z, and time. Okay? And um, so this is an equation which is uh, first order in time, and second order in x, y, and z. Uh, okay. And um, so, um, you know, are, we are going to um, put some, you know, input in by choosing a potential energy function like that. And that will uh, give us you know, the explicit form of Schrodinger's equation. And then we want to solve it for a particular potential energy. Um, and then once we do that, we want to um, calculate expectation values the same as before. Okay, so um, a typical problem to calculate an expectation value would be say, if we want to know the expectation value for the, the y component of the position, okay? that would be an integral dx dy dz of psi star of x, y, z, and t, and then negative i h bar d by d y of psi of x, y, z, and t. Okay, so the, the y over here corresponds to the y over there, right? So, um, you know, we're doing the same kind of thing as we did in one dimension with the, the integral sandwich or the inner product, we should really call it, right? But now we um, have an integral over all three variables, all three position variables, x, y, and z. And we remember that this is a definite integral over all x, y, z, from minus infinity to infinity. Um, okay, so you know, this all works pretty much like you would guess, right? Scaling up, you know, whatever we did for x before, now we have to do for x and for y and for z. And um, what else can we compare with before? How about the uncertainty principle? Okay, so um, the uncertainty principle that we learned in one dimension, that the uncertainty in X times the uncertainty in momentum in the x direction is greater than or equal to h bar over two, All right? So when we were doing it in one dimension, um, you know, we, we didn't have to say 
momentum in the x direction. We just said momentum because there was only one direction for momentum, right, back then. But now we've got to be a little bit more specific. When we say momentum, we have to say momentum in which direction, okay? And so what we, what we mean is the momentum in the x direction, right? That the, the uncertainty is between the x position and uh, momentum in the x direction. Now, the same thing works, of course, between the position in the y direction and the uncertain in the momentum in the y direction, right? That there's also an uncertainty principle for that. And there has to be an uncertainty principle for the position in the z direction and the momentum in the z direction, right? Those things are all true because there's nothing special about X, right? X or Y or Z, they're all just as good. But now you could ask, what about say the position in the X direction and the momentum in the Y direction? Is there any uncertainty principle about that? Um, and the answer is no, um, that there's no necessary relationship between the uncertainties in the X direction and the momentum in the Y direction, okay? So I could write that as greater than or equal to zero, which is kind of a trivial statement, right? I mean, because these are positive numbers these uncertainties are positive numbers. So of course, the or positive or zero numbers. And so of course, when you multiply them, you get something which is positive or zero. Um, a nice compact way to write this whole set of statements is using the Kronecker Delta, okay? So, I could take all of these statements and say, what's the uncertainty in position Ri times the uncertainty in momentum Pj? Okay, so we can say here, I equals X or Y or Z and J equals X or Y or Z, right? And this uncertainty has to be greater than or equal to H bar over two delta IJ. Okay, so this tells us that if we have I and J in the same direction, then the product of uncertainties is greater than or equal to h bar over two. And if we have different directions, then the product of uncertainties is greater than or equal to zero, which is kind of the trivial statement. Um, so uh, this thing with the Kronecker delta, this is um, nine inequalities in one. because it works for three values of i times three values of j, okay? So another nice compact notation. Um, alternatively, the same kind of thing could be written in terms of um, commutators. Okay. So, whoops, suppose we want to do it with commutators. Okay, so suppose I want to know the commutator of y with py, for example. Okay, so that means the commutator of y with negative i 
h bar d by d y. Okay. Well, I can figure this out by letting it act on a test function. Okay. So um, y acting on negative i h bar d by d y acting on a test function f of x y z. Okay. So this is negative i h bar d f d y. Okay, how about in the other order? If I have negative i h bar d by d y acting on y, which is multiplying f of x, y, z. Well, that's negative i h bar. And then I need to use the product rule for the derivative. Right? So I have a derivative with respect to y of the product, right? y times f of x, y, z. Okay? So that is uh, the derivative uh, of, what am I doing? Oh, I just noticed, I forgot a y in the equation. <laughs> okay, that's what I meant to say. All right, sorry, I lost momentum. Um, okay, so let's try again. Um, and the second line, negative i h bar, we have y, the first thing times the derivative of the second plus the derivative of the first thing, which is one uh, times the second, which is f. Uh, okay, so the difference between them, that's the commutator of y and py acting on the test function, that is minus i h bar y df dy. Okay, it's definitely this line, minus the stuff on this line, okay? So uh, that gives us plus i h bar y df dy and plus i h bar f. And we see this term cancels that term. And we are left with um, i h bar minus i h bar f of x, y, z. Okay, so now that we have this relation, we can just drop the f. So we can say the commutator of y and py is i h bar. And by the same argument, the commutator of z and pz is i h bar. And the commutator of x in px is i h bar. Okay, but now, now what about say the commutator of x with py? So the commutator of position in one direction times momentum in another direction. Okay. Well, let's figure that out. Okay, so if we want them to act on a test function. So x acting on minus i h bar d by d y acting on a test function f of x, y, z. So that gives us minus i h bar x d f d y. Okay, what about the other sequence? 
minus IH bar d by dy acting on x times f of x, y, z. Well, now this is actually easier than our last problem, right? Because the x factor is a constant with respect to y, right? The derivative of x with respect to y is zero, okay? So the x just factors out. So we get minus ih bar times x times df dy. It's the same thing. Okay. So the commutator of x with py acting on any test function is zero. And then we can drop the test function and say the commutator of x with py is zero. And the same is true for any component of position uh, commutator with a different component of momentum. So we could combine those things all and say the commutator of the I component of position with the J component of momentum is I H bar delta I J. So um, this is you know, nine commutators in one. Because again, I is X, Y, or Z, and J is X, Y, or Z. Okay. So now we have our relation for commutators. We have our relation for the uncertainty principle. Uh, and these things go together, as we proved that they must in general, right? That, that we proved in general that the uncertainty in A times the uncertainty in B has to be greater than or equal to a half times the absolute value of the commutator of A and B for any A and B. Okay, so that means if we put in that A is the position in direction I and B is the momentum in direction j. This product of uncertainties has to be greater than or equal to a half uh, absolute value of the commutator of Ri with pj. So it has to be greater than or equal to a half uh, absolute value of I H bar delta I J. So that is H bar over two delta I J. Okay, so it's, it's all consistent, right? And this general approach with commutators that we, we worked so hard to develop in chapter three, um, you know, it gives us correct guidance now that we get into three dimensions. Okay, so now I want to get to solving a particular problem. 
I don't have very much time, do I, today? Um, let me just tell you what the problem is, and then I'll solve it uh, on Thursday. Okay. So suppose now we want to solve the problem for a particle in a three-dimensional box instead of a one-dimensional box. Okay, so this is you know, the kind of box that Amazon normally uses. It's three-dimensional. Okay, so um, let's make up a potential energy that is V of X, Y, and Z, which is zero if X is between zero and A. And y is between zero and b. And z is between zero and c. Um, and the potential energy is infinity otherwise. Okay, so here I have a box, rectangular box, like this, okay, and in the x direction, the size is a, and in the y direction, the size is b, and in the z direction, the size is c. So, um, the particle is confined to be in this box, right? x has to be in this range, and y has to be in this range, and z has to be in that range. Okay? And um, it's confined because there would be infinite potential energy to have the particle anywhere else. All right? So this is a three-dimensional generalization of the problem that we did in one dimension before. Um, so this would be uh, a good example of, um, you know, a prototype three-dimensional quantum mechanics problem. Right? And so um, this is the problem that I will show you how to solve uh, on Thursday. Okay, so uh, I will stop here and I'll be glad to answer any questions about whatever's on your mind. Um, and then uh, we can continue on, on Thursday with the actual solution. Okay, thank you guys. See you then.